The story begins with a girl in a dress the color of a sea lagoon addressing a stranger, Judith, and saying that what she cannot possess, Judith will not have. If she has to die without taking anything with her, she would rather destroy everything so that it does not go to someone else. A blonde girl with blue eyes wakes up abruptly and realizes that it's all a dream. She thinks it's all nonsense. The heroine is frightened and asks herself if this is possible and answers that it is unlikely. The story takes place in the kingdom of Camulite. It turns out that the girl is the first princess Arabella Leon Camulite. Accompanied by a servant, she goes outside and sharply asks what is happening here. A young attractive brunette responds to these words and calls her sister. New servants stand nearby and bow their heads, saying that they are honored to meet the first princess. May the blessings and protection of Camulita come with her. Coming closer, the heroine says that enough foreplay is enough. The girl who called the protagonist her sister insultingly informs her that she was about to punish this low-class girl for fussing in front of her. The author clarifies that this is the second princess, Chloe Shuna Camulite. Pointing a finger at the innocent girl, she says that she had been ruining her mood since the morning. This vile person was walking on a road intended only for members of the imperial family and did not even realize it. The culprit of the quarrel, sitting down, said that she was honored to meet the first princess. In fact, this so-called low-class girl is the fourth princess, Judith Camulate. Arabella realizes that this is the first time she has seen her so close. Chloe had a reason for the noise. She didn't like the fact that the slave's illegitimate child had the golden eye color that was typical of the imperial family. Glancing at her sister, the first princess says that the deputy emperor has recognized her as their relative, so Judith has enough rights to be here. But the second princess is not at all pleased with her words, she simply explodes in anger. Arabella changes the subject, saying that it is much more important to her that Chloe has been in a bad mood since the morning, and she is concerned about it. So she suggests that they have a cup of tea because they haven't spent time together in a long time. The girl agrees, as if after thinking about it for a while, and says that they will have tea at Arabella's castle. The first princess asks the maid Marina to take Judith to the palace. Before they part ways, the girls make eye contact. The blonde girl wonders if the fact that she met Judith Camulin right after sleeping can be considered fate. Ten days later, the first princess falls ill. A maid enters her room with a tray and a cup in her hand. She asks how she is feeling and says that she has brought cold water with honey. Taking the cup, Arabella complains that even with the cold magic, her body still feels like a ball of fire. The servants want to support her and say that her strength will return soon. But the girl is not sure that she needs it. After all, she will be called upon to use magic again, after which she will lose consciousness. The deputy emperor tries to squeeze all the juice out of her before she dies, but Marina vehemently denies that this is not the case. The first princess is simply the greatest sorcerer in the empire. The blonde girl knows this, but she also realizes that in this situation she cannot be. While the maid puts a dampened cloth on her face, Arabella asks how the girl she met is doing. Marina asks if she is talking about the princess of the ice palace, and the first princess confirms her words and calls her Judith. The maid says that everything is as usual. She studies the history of the imperial family and spends the rest of her time alone. Marina asks why Arabella is interested, if she was attracted to the fourth princess. The blonde replies that she is simply related to her. However, Marina notices that recently she seems to have been replaced and asks if something has happened. But the princess calmly lies that everything is fine. In fact, she is worried about a dream she had during a severe fever. That night, in a mysterious place, she faced a cruel reality. In that place, she found a book about Judith. It said that at the age of 12, Judith Camulite believed that she could never be happy. The girl was born of a slave, so she was never treated as a human being in the palace. The princesses and the prince, especially the first princess Arabella, oppressed her countless times. One day, she suddenly awakened her power, and at that very moment, she became a great sorcerer, outsmarting all the members of the imperial family. The first princess was furious, wondering who could have written such nonsense. After all, you also need to know the right amount of discontent with the imperial family. Arabella thought that Judith would take everything from her, and so, driven by hatred, the girl turned to forbidden magic. 
The side effect of this was that she turned into a terrible monster who was only interested in killing and met her miserable end. When the book was released, the frightened first princess realized that this was the world of the brilliant Princess Judith. So, this girl is the protagonist of their world. Sitting in a warm bath, Arabella thinks that she can't just let this go. After observing for a couple of days, she became convinced that the events described in the book were really happening. There was everything from the evil maids who pushed Judith into the fountain to defame her to the abuse from her relatives. The first princess Arabella Leon Camulite is a purebred Camulite with an unsurpassed mind and great looks. She is the best sorcerer in the empire with natural magical powers and the strongest candidate for the next ruler. With such excellent credentials, the girl can't let her ending be so terrible. My lady looked tired, so the maid decided to make her a lime sherbet with honey. Seeing the world through Judith's eyes, what a cruel life she had, the things Arabella had taken for granted suddenly appeared in a different light. The first princess thanks the maids, and they, in turn, shining with joy, say that they are honored to serve Arabella and will try even harder. Observing the maids' reactions, the girl thinks that it is such a trifle, but they are already fussing. Maybe it's because it's the first time they've been thanked, although the heroine seems to think that she's done it from time to time. By the way, the book said that the princess was arrogant. Of course, Arabella believes that she is not superior to others, but she also lacks patience. The girl thinks that she needs to study the book anyway. Marina, combing the princess's hair, tells her that since she has not yet recovered, all official meetings have been cancelled, and asks what she wants to do today. The girl says that in the Hall of Eternal Night, the elderly ladies are probably discussing her again. She wants to go sunbathe and relax. The maid supports this idea, since the heroine has been in bed for several days. Arabella replies that she often gets sick, so it's nothing to her. Marina informs her that she is done, and says with admiration that the princess looks especially charming today. The princess, thinking about it, says that instead of sunbathing, she would rather visit her mother. On her way to the Empress's palace, she realizes that she hasn't been here for a long time, although she used to come every day when she was young. At that time, everything belonged to her. When she arrives, she sees a boy running towards a beautiful woman who looks like her. She calls him Milliam and tells him not to run so fast because he might fall. The young prince presents the woman with a gift, a beautiful wreath of flowers that resembles a crown. The prince, whose name is Milliam Wen Camelet, asks for permission to put it on the head of Empress Sherelle Delphinium. Arabella, with a stone face, says that it turns out that the Empress is now with Milliam. But the maid justifies herself by saying that she definitely sent a letter about her visit and will go to inform the mistress that the girl has arrived. The girl is disappointed to hear that there is no need because she feels like an unexpected guest who has made an appointment. Turning around, the heroine lies that she is dizzy, so it's time to go back. It is also time to inform her mother. Marina is surprised because she has traveled all this way and now she is just leaving. The maid begs her to at least say hello before she leaves, but the girl says that some other time. The princess thinks that her mother generously gave her boundless love, and then everything changed. Arabella was diagnosed with witch's fever. With this disease, the heart cannot cope with the enormous magical power, which leads to the splitting of the magical core from which the power comes, and the person eventually dies from unbearable heat and pain. No one can say how much time she has left. Perhaps because of her illness, she was considered worthless. Her mother kept it a secret and later gave birth to a brother. This one was Milliam. It seems she no longer needed a defective daughter. The third prince comes running out of the room. He rushes to Bella with loud, joyful shouts and asks if she has come to see him. Milliam informs him that she has come just as the reception is taking place in the garden and asks why she is leaving without even greeting him. The princess replies that she has a headache and the prince says that he can blow on it. My mother told me that he can cure it that way. Arabella is beautiful, so he will be happy to help her. The girl says that it is not necessary, but the boy objectionably grabs her by the front strand of her hair. Bella is angry, but without showing it, she says that she is feeling much better and thanks him for his concern. However, it is not cultural to grab people's hair like that, so the heroine asks him to let go. 
The red-faced prince argues that it's all because she didn't listen to him, and if she had bent down right away, it would have been no problem. Patting him on the head, Arabella replies that she understands. They say goodbye, and the girl wishes the prince a good time with his mother. The princess is sure that her mother must have realized she was coming as Milliam ran to her, but the empress did not even think to come to see her. This child receives her love while the girl feels pain again. After the bath, Bella thinks that she shouldn't have come to the empress. Her heart was weak because of a strange dream, and the princess thought she wanted to meet her mother, even though she knew she wouldn't look at her, no matter how hard she tried. She cherished her hair very much because she wanted her mother to touch it. People have always said that the first princess is very similar to her mother. From the back, they look the same. When everyone sees her long blonde hair, they immediately remember what the empress looked like when she was young. Bella thinks it's stupid. Marina, who is passing by her chamber, sees the girl taking scissors and cutting off her beautiful hair and screaming at the whole palace rushes to her. As she leaves, the princess asks the maid if she has heard any noise from the forest, but she replies with tears in her eyes that she has heard nothing. Arabella is confused by her behavior and wonders if she will show emotions like this every time on some trivial matter. Marina exclaims that this is not a trifle. The girl suddenly cuts off her hair without even saying anything. Her heart just breaks at the sight. The maid asks her why she decided to go to the forest, and she replies that she wants to check something. According to the book, aristocrats used to hunt children in this forest for fun. When this became known, the second Empress Catherine, who had been covering for them, became angry and, together with her daughter Chloe, took it out on Judith. If everything is true, then Bella will no longer be able to deny the truth of the book. Suddenly, the girl meets the runaway Baron of Western, the owner of Blois Forest. He asks her what brings her here. The princess says that she is glad to meet him and asks with suspicion what is wrong with his face, to which the Baron replies that everything is fine. The girl theatrically asks the maid about the summer hunting festival and whether it is held in the Flovis Forest. The Westerner, who was watching, says in confusion that the forest is called Blois. The princess says that the names are similar, so she got the forest mixed up. But they are hunting here anyway. She lies that hunting is her hobby and wants to watch the process. The frightened baron tries to talk her out of it, saying that it's dangerous now. If she enters the forest, she might get hurt. He Showing her strength, Arabella says that this is not a funny joke and asks who he thinks can harm her. Marina tries to calm her mistress down. The princess realizes that there is no point in continuing to investigate the Baron's reaction. Her magic suddenly detects someone approaching. A guy with red hair runs out of the forest at high speed, chased by a rabid wolf. The girl tells him to be careful and kills the animal with her magic. Rizik, looking at the charming beauty in amazement, asks if she is a princess of plants. The Knights of the Empire Shining say that the princess is indeed incredible. She has found the place of Baron Western's crimes and captured the villain only by intuition. Bella orders August to put everything in order and leaves. The First Lady wonders if it is possible to escape the verdict of fate and how to get rid of such thoughts, because her head is already spinning. In the palace, she encounters Judith, the person in whose presence she is most uncomfortable. Arabella asks where the fourth princess's maid of honor is, and, to the girl's confused look, explains that every princess must be accompanied by a maid of honor. Judith thanks her for her concern and promises that she will not forget about it next time. Turning away, Bella leaves, citing business. In the evening, the girl asks Marina to bring her all the magic video stones, because videos from her childhood will help improve her mood. In the first video, the girl says hello and says that she turned five last week. Today, she came with her zebra friend, and they are happy to greet everyone. The maid admiring the picture says that no matter how many times you watch it, you will never get bored with this collection of videos with the angel princess. No wonder sales among imperial collectors went through the roof, there were rumors that they filled the state treasury, but the girl says that's just a rumor. In the next recording, the princess is asked to teach levitation spells. She explains that you just need to separate a little magic and wrap a drop of water in it and then lift it. Marina says that she is amazing because this magic stone is used even in children's books on elementary magic. Bella sees no point in being incredible 
because the protagonist of this world is just waiting for her to fall. Even if this useless book described her future, she still doesn't know when the disease will take her life. It's so strange, it feels like the horrible girl from the dream is closer than the happy child from the video. A few days later, the first princess comes to Chloe's tea party and invites her to go to the fountain, because her mother is waiting. On the way, Arabella thinks that the fake hair is too much. She reluctantly agrees, as Marina insisted. The princess greets Empress Catherine while they say that it is an honor to receive Bella, but she did not expect her to come. She had heard that she has been spending more time in the castle lately. The heroine says that she has an unusual drive to learn. As soon as she starts, she stops feeling the passage of time while learning magic formulas. The girl realizes that Catherine still doesn't like her. Catherine says that Ramiel also taught them all night yesterday. But Chloe reminds her that two days ago he drove the magic teacher to quit. Because of this, her mother yells at the girl and orders her to be quiet. The first princess realizes that Catherine is in a bad mood today, and it is probably because of the events in the Blois Forest. I remember that all the victims of the manhunt were saved, but the book says that one of them died. Katerina irritably wishes the girls to have fun and leaves. Chloe wants to introduce Bella to her friends, because they are very excited about her arrival. The girl often praises the first princess. The heroine agrees with the hope that she will be able to change the future described in the book. The second princess brings her sister to her friends, and they are eager to attract the attention of the first princess. Bella says that she is glad to meet them and suggests that they have a good time, because Chloe has done a great job of organizing this event. The heroine thinks that they are alike. The meeting is organized in the usual style, and the princess can't believe that Catherine allowed it. She wants to have some fun and leave early. Suddenly, all the girls hear some sounds and see a frightened Judith in front of them. Bella does not understand why she came. Everyone discusses how Baroness Cannon hit her on the cheek with a fan, but she justifies herself by saying that she just wanted to scare the bug away and didn't expect it to hurt Judith. The ladies see that she just wanted to take the cookies and mock her because the princess got hit in the face for it. Chloe says that she has lost her mind to stay here. Arabella realizes that she had ignored Judith during the tea party and only noticed her now to mock her. She recalls that in the book she joins in the girls' fun, but now she does not want to participate in such games. She snatches the fan from the shocked Baroness and hits her under the pretext that there are a lot of bugs in the garden in summer, and one of them wanted to land on her shawl. The princess did not do this out of pity. She is just disgusted by the sight of mean tricks. Everyone is surprised by Bella's behavior, but no one can say a word. The girl says it's funny because insects flew into their tea party and activates her power. The girl hits the Baroness with it again and tells her that one of the bugs wanted to sit on her shoulder. The lady says it's nothing. She saw the beetle flying over and thanks the first princess for scaring it away. Arabella mockingly wonders why she is blushing, because she has just done the same thing to Judith. The heroine is surprised that no one understands her actions and despises Chloe's friends. The second princess, flying up to the blonde, praises her and explains that her sister has always been like that. She is sweet and beautiful, and she treats her neighbors even better, although it should be a secret. Chloe, addressing Judith menacingly, tells her to leave and not to spoil the atmosphere, and also advises her to go to the third princess, because Lillian seems to be looking for her. Frightened and ashamed, the fourth princess thanks her for the invitation to the tea party and hurriedly leaves. Now Judith Camulite is a half-breed, born of the Emperor's slave. But later, as soon as she awakens her enormous magical power, it turns out that the girl is a descendant of an ancient magical empire. After observing the fourth princess, Bella orders her maid to pack all the cookies and take them to Judith's palace. The girl with dark thoughts tries to keep her enemy closer than her friend and decides to give the oppressed girl a banal and insignificant kindness. Suddenly, the first princess remembers Chloe's words about Judith heading to the third princess and abruptly jumps to her feet, because the book said that the girl almost got into big trouble when a magic plant attacked her on the way to Lily. Arabella didn't think it would happen today, because the book didn't mention the third princess's tea party. She hears the brunette scream and arrives just as the terrible monster plant grabs her leg with its green long shoots. The heroine orders the girl not to move and destroys the plant with her power. 
Bella approaches the frightened girl and asks her if she is okay, to which Judith, sitting with tears in her eyes, replies that she was very scared. The first princess says that the magic garden is dangerous in this place, but the brunette says that she could not help herself because the smell was too sweet. She throws herself into Arabella's arms with gratitude. Bella continues her lecture about how the plants easily lure those who are not resistant to the magical enzymes. Next time she should be more careful and not walk here. It turns out that the girl was growing this giant flower for her potions research. Luckily, only the stem is cut, and the Nepenthes flowers are intact. She suddenly hears a familiar voice behind her. A handsome young man with raven-colored hair and eyes as blue as the sky says he heard screams and asks if it was Arabella. It's strange, because it didn't sound like their favorite sister. The girl screams at Ramiel, but he jokingly says that she fed someone to a plant and the scream came from her stomach. The author clarifies that this is the first prince, Ramiel Ron Camulite. In the book, it was not Bella who saved Judith, but he. Then, under the guise of helping the poor girl, the boy burned all the princess's plants. The heroine remembers everything, so she looks angrily at Ramiel, although he does not understand what he did wrong. Arabella asks what the prince is doing in the magical garden, and if he has come to touch her nepentes, the girl is against it. But the narcissistic young man says, beaming, that he prefers plants as beautiful as he is, but such monstrous creatures as this are not in his repertoire. The second empress is concerned about nominating her son for the role of crown prince. However, he himself is not interested in the throne at all. In the book, the boy mocked Judith and was punished by the main character. The princess orders him to leave, but Ramiel hugs her and asks if the blonde is too cold with her own older brother. The girl tells him to shut up, because he was born only seven months later than she was, and hits him on the arm. Hurrying after her, the first prince asks how he can call such a cold-blooded lady his sister. The heroine tries to run away, saying that she has no time to play with him. The handsome man is disappointed by how quickly Bella left him and thinks that the girl is hiding something, so he sends a snake to her by magic, which will secretly keep track of her. In the evening of the same day, a parcel from the first princess was brought to the palace of the fourth princess. Judith sees that it contains the cookies she wanted to take to the tea party and is touched by her sister's act. The girl recalls all the times Arabella saved her that day and realizes that this is the first time someone has ever cared about her so much. Taking the box, the princess decides that she will eat these cookies for a very long time to make them last. The next day, the princess receives a letter from the third young master of the Monter household. Marina asks what kind of books they are, and the heroine lies that they are books about experiments in magical pharmacology, but in fact, they are about the wizard's fever. Bobby Monter writes that the first princess is born to be loved, and if she has already called him in person, he will try to appear in the best possible light. The maid reminds us that the heroine signed up for this herself. Five years ago, many young men from prestigious families came to her as candidates for marriage, but her illness complicated things. This was not discussed publicly, as it is unreasonable to look for a husband for a princess with an unclear future. Bella notices a snake crawling through the window. She tells Marina that the insect seems to have penetrated the palace's barrier, the maid believes that the aging has come here with the letter and swears that she will be more careful. The princess activates a spell and guesses that this magical power belongs to either Ramiel or the second empress. Remembering the time of the dinner with the emperor, the girl goes to the banquet hall. In the hall, under the shocked gazes of the heroine's brothers and sisters, Emperor Cedric Siegbar's Lazen Camulite asks what happened to Arabella's hair. The girl realizes with regret that she has recently been bedridden, but her father hasn't even worried about her, as he usually does. She just needs to sit in silence, because the first thing he saw was her cropped hair, not the princess's condition. Ramiel jumps up and asks what happened, and if anyone broke her heart because yesterday her hair was still long. Arabella angrily threatens that she will not hesitate to use a silencing spell on him if he continues to talk nonsense. However, the emperor interrupts them, tiredly ordering that children should not behave like that at the table. Cedric tells the second prince that he hasn't played sports for a long time, and the first prince has already done something. The servants told him about it. 
The first princess thinks that the emperor is pretending to be a father, not really going into details, and only with Ramiel. The emperor tells Bella to continue in the same spirit. Everyone thinks she's perfect because of her father's attitude, but perhaps they explain it to themselves by saying that the girl is sick. On the street, the first prince asks the heroine again if her heart has been broken. Chloe would have been shocked to see the girl, but she didn't come because she overslept. The princess is furious, she wants to punish the boy. The brunette happily exclaims that he is happy because nothing has happened and offers to celebrate her new haircut together by taking a few photos with him on the magic stone. However, confused by this behavior, the blonde rejects the offer. Suddenly they hear screams and see the heretic Bella rescued in the forest, being held by a man by a rope and yelled at to obey. According to the first prince, this man is the son of Count Rasner, who was arrested a month ago for using forbidden magic. It's interesting that a family that contributed to the empire has slipped into this. Count Glenn Rasner is a man who made a name for himself in the Hall of Eternal Night thanks to his unusual appearance and exceptional magical abilities. It is said that after an unexpected loss, he gradually began to change. As a result, he broke all ties with society and hid from everyone in his home. The news that such a person had sinned by using forbidden magic turned into a topic for heated discussions. The Count faces either execution or life imprisonment. His family was also punished. They will serve in the Hall of Eternal Night for five years. Family members will have to go through a kind of re-education. I feel sorry for them, because at one point, people lost everything. Arabella thinks that she is the one who was supposed to die because of the ban on magic, saved the son of a sinner who lost everything for the same reason. The girl does not remember such a moment in the book, and is disgusted by the situation and thinks it was an accident. Despite her objections, Ramiel brings the stone to her and tearfully asks her to take a picture, because her presence in the picture will increase sales. The girl, not at all moved, breaks the stone and says that it was he who was watching her castle today. The heroine forbids the prince to show his face with the stone or anything else. Ramiel thinks about the fact that at the table, Arabella had an expression on her face as if she was about to cry. If she really got her heart broken, he would like to teach the guy who did it a lesson. The prince tried to see what she was doing all the time in the palace, but the girl is too attentive so nothing happened. He does not really believe that his sister is busy with her studies. The first prince mentions that the heroine is interested in the fourth princess and thinks that he should take a closer look at her too. The girl didn't say anything about Judith, so he wants one of his kites to be next to the brunette and two more near his mother, because lately she has been meeting with the prince's uncle too often. They are definitely planning something. The first princess came to the library because the butler's archives had no information about the magician's fever, but it seems that there is nothing here either. If there was a cure, her mother and the emperor would have found it long ago. For them, she is an important princess whose life is very valuable. But the girl doesn't want to rely on anyone else she will find her own solution and determine her own value. The girl decides to look into the forbidden section, which has a spell against theft on the door. There are many books in this section that she has not even seen or known about. This is a public library built by wizards. There, the heroine finds a book called The Other Side. The book says that only a few special great sorcerers can see the secrets of this world. Anyone who can resist the truth will be able to get to a place that the wizards call the other side. Bella nervously guesses that this is the place she saw in her dream. In a vast space, there are an infinite number of bird cages with light blobs that preserve the essence of the world. After visiting this world, the girl's life was divided into before and after, so it is most likely true. The girl thinks that it would be better to describe the method of treatment here, not all this. To stop the trouble in the world of the peerless Princess Judith, Bella made a sacrifice to use forbidden magic. She had to kill an innocent person to stop the disease from developing. It is logical that after that the heroine turned into a monster and died. She starts to think that it is possible not to be a monster, if you just stop after the disease recedes. Almost no one knows about her illness, so all she needs to do is sacrifice a person no one will look for. If she succeeds, she can change her fate. Suddenly, a golden seal on the door appears in front of the girl, preventing her from leaving. The barrier suddenly buzzes. 
If someone comes in now, the girl will be in big trouble. Duke Killian Bearheart comes to Arabella and asks her to move away from the barrier and put the book down, because they are not allowed to take them out of this section of the library. The girl hopes that he did not see what book she took. At this point, the Duke says that he has heard the news that the girl does not leave his palace, so it is a great fortune for him to meet her here, and an honor to observe such incredible beauty with his own eyes. The first princess says that she has heard about his knighthood and hopes that his father is proud of him. Killian Bearheart is the only descendant of a family that is called one of the two pearls of the empire. He has an unusual appearance and manners, as well as incredible swordsmanship and magic. Until she was diagnosed with a mage's fever, Killian was the strongest candidate for Bella's husband. At the time, she was not interested in marriage, so she sent him only a few letters out of politeness. However, now her opinion has changed, because in the world of the unrivaled Princess Judith, Killian became the fourth princess's fiancé. Moreover, he defended her, and he treated the heroine with hostility, which is why he is now interested in the princess, despite his lack of feelings. Referring to urgent matters, the girl tries to leave the Duke, but the book begins to sparkle in the girl's hands. Killian says that since she is so busy, he can return the book to the shelf. But the girl, under his supervision, does it herself. The princess is outraged that the Duke appeared just as she was taking the book. She notices that he seemed to be mocking her, or perhaps she was just imagining things. The girl hears screams and begins to observe a painting where the second prince of Lloyd, Brill Camulite, is standing with an evil dog and does not let Judith into his palace, even though she begs him. He doesn't understand what's bothering the girl, but she tries to hint that it's the dog that's preventing her from entering. My lord says that Ricky is not doing anything and to stop whining for no reason. The first princess realizes that she hadn't even noticed Judith before, but lately she has been catching her eye more and more often. The girl also notices the shadow of Ramiel hovering behind the fourth princess. Lloyd says that he is already bored with her and advises her to hurry up, because the dog is about to bite her. Suddenly, the branches of the plant wrap around his legs and lift him up. The frightened prince realizes that it is Bella. The first prince begins to cry and begs his sister to let him go, but the girl just walks by. Judith thinks with delight that the first princess has saved her again, but she did so only because the girl's presence made too much noise. Arabella comes to the bird's garden, greets them, and apologizes for not being able to come as often as she used to. She excuses herself by saying that she hasn't been feeling well lately, while the birds circle her offended. It seems to her that no one needs her in this castle. It's as if she's stuck in a strange place and trapped. It's funny that such feelings arise in the greenhouse she loves the most. It occurs to Bella that these birds feel the same way, so she releases them and tells them to fly wherever they want. At least they will be truly free. The princess notices that someone is watching her. It turns out to be Count Rasner's son. She is surprised because no one can enter her greenhouse without permission. They hear a commotion in the castle. People are looking for some heretic, and Bella asks if it is the boy standing in front of her. He remains silent, his head bowed in concern, while the guards decide to activate the magic chains he was wearing. Grabbing Bella by the arm, the redhead asks her to lead him to the exit of the castle, and if she agrees, he will not harm her, and will simply help her escape from here as well. The girl notices that the boy has loosened his grip on her arm and agrees to show her the way to the back door, ordering her to follow him. Secretly, Arabella mocks the boy. She asks him how he got into the greenhouse, since the door can only be opened by her magic. The Duke's descendant says that the door opened by itself, and the princess decides that she needs to check the magic stones. The young man asks her again if she is the princess of magic plants, and says that he has already asked, and wonders if he was surprised by the magic stone. Rizik replies that there were no others at home. It turns out that the boy had a magic stone with a record of little Arabella collecting leaves and making a crown out of them to give to her mother. Such stones were usually collected by imperial collectors and sold to duke families. The girl replies that it was taken off a long time ago when he was a child and asks why he is talking to her in such an informal tone. The blushing guy apologizes and the princess cheerfully says that this is the first time this has happened to her, and it is very unusual. She had a very bad day today, 
but thanks to the redhead it became much better. So this time she will forgive him. As soon as they go beyond the barrier, the magic on the chains activates, and the boy is caught by himself. The girl asks where he will go after he leaves the palace, and the boy confidently says that he will go where he is needed. Hearing these words, the princess wonders what kind of life he had before. She brings him to the door, and the guy, having thanked her sincerely, is about to leave. But at the moment when the girl wants to stop him, the magic chains around his neck are activated. All the palace guards come running and they take the heretic away, asking if my lady is all right. She replies that everything is fine and nothing special has happened. She orders them not to treat the boy so rudely, because although he is a criminal, he is still a child. Watching the disappointed offspring of the duke being led away, the princess thinks that there is nothing to worry about because he would have been caught anyway. The maid tells the first princess that Chloe was angry with the princess of the ice castle again today. She ordered the fourth princess to stay away from her. Bella says that if anyone heard this, they would think that the castle belongs to Chloe. The girl does not understand why they behave like this. It's also strange that Judith keeps walking around and catching Chloe's eye. There would be no problem if she just turned around and walked in the other direction. Marina says that she is watching Judith as the first princess ordered and asks if she should intervene when she is being insulted. But Bella says that the maid should not worry about her and orders her to leave. As soon as Marina leaves, she takes a book from the secret area of the palace library. The girl was very curious and wanted to know everything that was written there. If she can find something, she will make fewer mistakes. The basics of each type of forbidden magic are different, but there is the same condition, and that is sacrifice. To make it work, you need to use a person whose magic is best combined with the caster's magic. Arabella recalls that in the book, her victim was Judith's knight named Geralt. They had the best combination of magic. Both the knight and the fourth princess had dubious origins. Moreover, he was a heretic from the Order of the White Knight. Suddenly, the girl realizes that this knight is the boy she met in the greenhouse. The book goes on to describe the celebration of the fourth princess's birthday. Everyone congratulates her, while Bella stands aside. People are discussing her anger that her younger sister will become the next ruler, because in this situation, she will have to ask permission to stay in the palace. At this point, out of anger, Arabella casts magic over the fourth princess, causing the ceiling to fall off. But the knight manages to save her from the heavy debris. It turns out to be an exploded chandelier. While all the people are running away, the first princess approaches the victims and mocks the half-breed princess and her heretic knight. Judith's faithful companion is Geralt. In the book, she used him as a victim. The boy stands in front of her bound by magic chains and does not understand what she is going to do. But he will not let the girl harm the future empress anyway. Bella says that he has given his heart and soul into Judith's hands, so his blood and flesh will belong to the first princess. With a sword, she orders him to regret even after his death that he had come to her attention and constantly interfered with her service. Finally, the girl finds a way to be cured in the book, but it requires a sacrifice. However, the fact that the other side of the world showed her this book may mean that this time, the guy will have to be saved instead. Bella has to get him. The next day, Judith runs up to her on a walk, but because of her carelessness, she stumbles and falls painfully. The first princess does not understand her behavior. In turn, the girl says, embarrassed, that she just wanted to say hello to her. Arabella notices that the girl's servants are laughing at her. Seeing that the princess is looking at them, they stop mocking and greet her. They begin to flatter the first princess, but she firmly turns to Judith. She helps her up and asks her if she has a bruise. The princess of the ice castle replies that she is fine and quickly apologizes for the awkward situation. The maids see that the princess has not accepted their greeting and stand bent over, not knowing what to do next. Arabella wonders why Judith allows them to treat her like this. She may be half their age, but she is still a princess. Perhaps she is stupid, or just shy, and the shadow of Ramiel is still with her. The first princess notices that there are some marks on the girl's hands. She asks where they came from, but she replies that she goes to class. Bella very much doubts that any teacher would want to take her as a student and asks what kind of class it is. 
She gets an explanation that the third Princess Lillian invited her to train with Viscount Thorson. Arabella still asks how this training has anything to do with the injury to her hands. Does the teacher really hit the girl when something doesn't work out? But she denies it and gives an unexpected answer that she is hit when the third princess does not know the right answer. The first princess is deeply shocked by these words. Judith happily says that it doesn't hurt much and that it is very pleasant to find out the correct answer after being hit. Arabella disagrees with her because it looks like discrimination and is not done in the modern world. Lillian made it all up. She has completely lost her common sense. The older sister asks the younger one to give her her hands and heals them with magic, asking her why she was running. The girl replies that she couldn't thank her properly last time, but the blonde girl argues that she hasn't done anything worth thanking. Judith explains that whenever she begs for help, the first princess always appears, and she also sent her cookies. Referring to the meeting, Bella says it's time to go and casually tells the maids that she has accepted their greetings and they can straighten up. The fourth princess waits for the next meeting, but Arabella, angrily walking away, thinks that she is stupid to hope for another meeting and even smile. Do you really have to be so naive to become the main character in the world? Suddenly, she hears her mother's voice from the side. The girl hopes that she has come to visit her, because she is worried because she heard the news about the events in the greenhouse. In addition, the Empress even addressed the girl herself. The heroine thinks about telling her mother everything she thinks and asks her what brought her here. But the latter, looking at her with a terrible look, asks if the first princess has gone mad. When she heard this gossip, she thought that maybe it was a mistake. The girl must have forgotten that being a princess, she shouldn't be around someone of such lowly origin. Arabella is the first princess, the daughter of the Empress and the sister of Milliam, so she must behave in a manner worthy of them. Her father will abandon her as soon as she becomes unnecessary, and her mother doesn't care how defective she is. After all, her younger brother gets all her love. But Judith is the main character who, having overcome all the difficulties, will eventually emerge victorious. Standing in front of the mirror and waiting to be changed, the princess thinks how much she would like to get rid of it all. One of the maids accidentally pricks her with a needle. Everyone is worried if my lady is okay, but she replies that she was just thinking and suddenly became agitated, so everything is fine. Marina explains that she has a lot of work to do, as this is the main costume for the hunting festival. It's almost ready. They just need to wait a little longer. Bella asks how old Judith is, and the maid hesitantly replies that she is somewhere around 12. At 16, she will awaken her magic. Wouldn't it be better to get rid of her now? But is the first princess one of those who thinks so superficially? She sends all the maids, including Marina, out of her room because she doesn't want anyone to see her broken heart. The princess starts watching the video on the stones again. No matter how hard she tries, she cannot return to that time of the happy girl from the video, which no longer exists. That day was the longest night of her life. In the morning, my lady orders the shocked Marina to throw away all her video stones. She doesn't need them anymore. The maid cries that even though Arabella doesn't need them anymore, they are of great value to her. At the maid's request, Bella gives her all the stones for safekeeping. The princess says that she is going for a short walk, and when Marina asks where she is going, the girl smiles and says that she is going to the palace of the third princess. Viscount Thorson did not expect the first princess to come, and neither did the third princess, Liliane Serene Camulite. She had heard about their training and wanted to observe the process. The Viscount realizes that she knows about Judith's beating with a pointer. They decide to first review the topic of the previous lesson. Thorson asks her to tell him first about the origin of the treaty between Camulite and the neighboring states of Sino and Borleo. Looking at Judith, Lillian mumbles and does not know what to say. The Viscount asks the fourth princess to come to him and begins to hit her with a pointer on her hands, but Bella asks if he is immortal, because he can do something like that in her presence. The girl breaks his pointer with her own hands with a dangerous look. She thinks that he has forgotten his duties and suggests ways to deal with his vile hands that have harmed a member of the Imperial family. Lillian tries to say something, but the princess quickly shuts her up. Thorson justifies himself by saying that he was only fulfilling the wishes of the third princess. Arabella asks if the Viscount would have hit her if Lillian had asked him to, 
but he replies that he would never have done such a thing. The girl cannot believe that the wise teacher has succumbed to the influence of the young princess and threatens to tell her father. She orders him to leave and Thorson swears that this will never happen again. The first princess yells at Lillian and asks if she has gone mad. How can you use Judith for your punishments? What kind of stupidity is this? The girl tries to justify herself, but Judith interrupts her, saying that she wanted to go to the classes herself and agreed to the conditions, so the third princess is not to blame. Lillian confirms her words, but Bella growls that she shouldn't make excuses and that next time she will be cut out. The fourth princess does not understand why the first princess is worried about her even in this situation. Her older sister orders her to tell her if it happens again. Since the girl is so eager to go to class, Bella invites the teacher to visit her. The brunette, fascinated by these words, asks what she means. Arabella is disappointed to think that she always behaves like this when she sees the younger girl. That is, she says things she would never have thought of. Despite her regret and despair, time flies and it is time for the hunting festival, and the first princess has not yet decided which way to go. Ramiel greets his younger sister with a loud round of applause and says that she looks as beautiful as he does today. He also asks if she has prepared a speech for the opening ceremony, to which the girl gives a confident, positive answer. Chloe notices that Belle has changed her hairstyle and asks what happened, but the first princess replies that she simply changed her style to match her mood. When asked if it turned out badly, her younger sister enthusiastically says that she looks incredible, like the main character from the popular book The Night of the Star Hurricane. People start discussing Arabella's haircut. They believe that any style suits the girl, and in real life her hair looks even better than on the video stones. Ramiel says that Bella managed to become the Moon Princess again, because the palace sold more than a million of her stones. The guy is sure that the girl's mother must have been disappointed, because this time she was incredibly motivated to make the best video. However, the blonde confidently denies that she can't help it, because the public loves her. The first prince asks how she made such a popular video. Marina reminded the princess that she had to shoot a video for the competition at a time when everyone else had already done it. For example, Ramiel made a recording of his fruitful work in the classroom. The girl is sure that his mother Katerina was watching. The maid supports her opinion, because the first prince used to try to distinguish himself in any way possible. Usually, his videos were too frank. In the penultimate recording, the first prince was more beautiful than flowers, or an asmar from the first prince that is more charming than jewelry, lasting two hours. The princess recalls with disgust that his strange antics were included in the collection. Then they discuss how the third prince made a crown of flowers and presented it to the empress. Bella thinks that Milliam copied it and tells Marina that no idea comes to mind now. The maid says with a glow that there are many requests to see the first princess with Prince Milliam, even the empress herself wants to. But Arabella reminds her that they already filmed something like this last year, called The Good Princess Feeds Her Brother Sweets. It's not that the girl wants to brag in front of society, but she doesn't like the way her mother uses the title of first princess in Milliam's interests. Suddenly, an idea comes to the princess's mind, and she orders Marina to bring the monostones that watch over the greenhouse. Bella has come up with something, so they need to be seen. She uses the scene where she releases the pigeons from the greenhouse because there are great shots and the words that came out of their mouths were incredibly sincere. Ramiel says it's good to be talented. He also wanted to try to sell more than a million video stones. And Chloe can't wait to finally be chosen as the princess of the month. Lillian argues that this will never happen with these videos. Ramiel offers Arabella a dubious idea to shoot a joint video that will gain more than 2 million hearts in a short period of time, but the girl replies that he films strange things every day, and that's enough for him. Lillian again wants to insult Judith, who is sitting next to them. She says that there is one person at the table who has definitely taken the wrong place, because this princess has not made a single magic stone. Bella notices that Chloe is sitting next to Judith, which is quite strange. The second princess orders to bring more cold drinks because the weather is very hot today. She is offered strawberry juice, which she loves, but she says that today she wants something lighter. For example, mint tea or lemonade, because strawberry juice is too much. When the drink is served, the girl, shouting that it's time to drink, 
pours the mint tea on the fourth princess. Everyone is shocked by this act, but Chloe casually says that she couldn't help it and thought that no one was sitting here at all. Bella blames herself for not realizing why the girl specifically took a drink that was not hot and colorful. Chloe continues her performance, telling Judith that she shouldn't come to the hunting festival looking like this. Meanwhile, everyone is already actively discussing the events taking place at the table of the descendants of the Empire. The first princess gets up from the table and tells the second princess that she is not at home in the palace, so if she does not want to undermine their family's reputation, she must be careful. Arabella asks Judith to get up, saying that even if it's Chloe's fault, she shouldn't be wearing such dirty clothes to the festival. The fourth princess is sure that she should be at the hunting festival, but the first princess is wondering what to do with her. Looking at Chloe, Bella realizes what she needs to do next. She asks the second princess to borrow some clothes for Judith. The first princess, not listening to Chloe's objections, says that she hopes everyone will learn today's lesson. You need to be able to take responsibility for your mistakes. Going to the balcony, Chloe hears other nobles discussing her good heart because she lent the fourth princess clothes, so the girl did not get into trouble. This means that the second princess has become very mature. The brunette blossoms from what she has heard and thinks that the first princess did this to calm her down. At this moment, they are informed that Duke Bearheart has arrived at the palace. The princesses begin to fuss and ask Vivian, who told them the news, if they have dressed well. After all, they had specially prepared for this meeting. Bella orders them to behave with dignity and mentions that Killian is connected to Judith, no matter what they do. She shakes at the thought that they have a love affair. Although the time when he was a candidate for the girl's husband is long gone, he has no business with Bella anymore. The opening of the hunting festival begins. It has been held since ancient times to celebrate the prosperity of the empire. For this reason, especially during the harvest season, the emperor will pray for human souls and turn the floor over to the first princess Camulita, who will give her welcome speech. Ramiel asks Chloe how long their elder sister's speech last time lasted, and she remembers that she wrote about 10 pages, but it seems that now there are 15. Arabella is bored with the constant words about the prosperity and well-being of the Empire, so she changes her welcome speech with a fireworks display. Everyone is surprised by this enthusiastic greeting, but the Emperor and Empress seem to be out of sorts at this prank. Bella sees the favorable reaction of the audience, so she decides to launch another fireworks display with a message about the bald Emperor encoded in the runes. Luckily, no one understands these signs, so everyone thinks it's some kind of beautiful drawing. Milliam tells his parents that it is the first time he has seen such a thing, and the emperor softens his opinion. The fireworks were not planned, but if everyone is happy, then let it be. The first princess thinks that no one understands this ancient language, so she adds a few more inscriptions. Runes appear on the fireworks that the emperor wears artificial hair and has monkey ears. This is the first time Bella has ever staged such a riot in front of everyone, and she loves it. Suddenly, she catches sight of the infinitely handsome Killian, who is laughing into his hand, and she convinces herself that she doesn't like him. When the girl comes down from the pedestal, everyone starts asking her what those signs were. The first princess lies that it is an ancient language, and she wrote congratulatory messages, praying for the well-being of the empire and the health of their ruler. Everyone is sure that the heroine put a lot of meaning into it. She felt great until Killian ruined everything. The girl does not understand why he looked at her and smiled. They will meet again at the fights later. But the princess already hates him. She hears the voice of the Marquis Junot Graham, the twin brother of the second empress, and immediately darkens her face. Bella knows perfectly well that he is a reliable ally of Catherine's, who is concerned that Ramiel should become the next emperor. The Marquis informs her that he has heard about all the recent events that have happened to the First Princess. Junon concludes that she has been very busy lately. Arabella replies that she wanted to relax, but she has no choice because the country needs her. The Marquis explains that she is the chief sorcerer after all. The girl decides to ask about their closeness with Baron Western, the culprit behind the recent incident in the Blois Forest. Hearing this, the Marquis immediately becomes cold and says that they have only crossed paths once, no more. Bella concludes that thanks to her, Junon was able to avoid meeting a dangerous man, 
but the girl does not need to thank him. The Marquis says that he cannot be ungrateful, so he thanks her from the bottom of his heart. The man also brings up the fact that one of the rescued men was a heretic. He had heard that he was sent to the Hall of the White Knights, although he would have been better off dying in the forest. The first princess was confused by his words. The Marquis justified himself by saying that he just felt sorry for the boy because of the life the Count's descendant was going to have. As a child, he was friends with his father, Mr. Rasner. Earlier, when everyone was surprised by his arrest, Junon kept in touch with his wife, Garnet, while she was alive. But the future is an unpredictable thing. Of course, he does not diminish the importance of the girl's efforts to expose the crime. Graham asks if she believes him. Bella convinces this slippery man that it is impossible not to believe a sincere man like him. The Marquis thanks her and says that he is indebted to her and hopes to repay her in any way he can. When Junon leaves, the third son of the Monterre family, Bobby, runs up to the first princess. Arabella realizes that they haven't seen each other for a long time, and the young Monterre confirms her words. He swears that he has been looking forward to this meeting. Bobby praises Bella's beauty today. When he saw her on stage, his heart beat so fast that it felt like it was going to jump out of his chest. He was extremely touched by the letter the princess sent in response to his message. I remember that her mother turned her back on her, and she decided to send everyone a template response. Monter's third son says he wrote another song for Bella. After watching the video this month, he was overwhelmed with inspiration and asks to be honored to listen to the lines that the boy dedicated to the princess. The girl is shocked and doesn't know how to get rid of him. All those present are actively watching them. Arabella thanks him for the offer, but asks him to stop because there are too many people around and they are embarrassing her. As soon as Bobby wants to start singing, Killian comes to the rescue, having come to see the princess. Confused by the appearance of Duke Bearheart, Bobby retreats and lets them discuss important matters. The first princess asks what he wanted to talk about, but looking at her with a strange look, the Duke replies that he intervened when he saw how uncomfortable she was. He apologizes if it was unacceptable for the girl. Bella thanks him from the bottom of her heart. Killian asks if she is close to the Count. He says that he did not know about her exchanging letters with any of the candidates for the role of her husband until now. But then, why is he not receiving these letters? Arabella asks him to repeat himself because she did not hear what he was saying over the noise. The girl notices that the Duke looks at her as if in pain, but he lies, saying that he did not say anything important. Bearheart tells her about the rumors about the first princess's participation in the competition. The girl confirms them and says that, unfortunately, she failed to win last time. Killian hopes that she will get the laurel wreath, but last time it was the Duke who won. After all, the laurel wreath goes to the most deserving candidate. Bella is surprised that the Duke wished her victory. If she hadn't gotten sick last time, the laurel wreath would have been hers. After changing the girl's clothes, Marina gives her time to rest. The princess thinks that even if she has to lose to Judith, nowhere did it say that she has to lose to the main character as well. The heroine needs to go to the Hall of the Evening Sun and deal with other matters. It was an unexpected twist for her that Count Rasner and Marquis Graham were involved with that boy, but it doesn't change her plan. After re-education, the boy will be released only after five years. Only the priests of the Evening Sun deal with heretics, so no one is allowed there, not even a member of the Imperial family. Bella needs to offer them something valuable. For example, they will definitely be interested if a person from the Castle of the Evening Sun takes over the business. Everyone is discussing what gifts they gave the first princess for good luck in the hunting competition. One court lady says she brought a ribbon with embroidered initials. Another wanted to give a gift to Duke Bearheart, but he never accepts them. Also, the Duke did not receive any honors, although this should be his privilege. Then there is the argument about who will win this year. Judith is confidently approaching the princess's tent. She walks over to Bella and begins to praise her fireworks and compliments her on her incredible new haircut. The heroine thanks her and sees the shadow of Ramiel. Judith shyly wants to give Arabella a handkerchief with wishes for victory in the tournament embroidered on it. The first princess realizes that she made it herself because her hands are covered with small wounds. The old woman begins to suspect that the brunette endured all the abuse at the table just to give her this shawl. 
The heroine does not understand why she is treated this way. She doesn't like Judith. In the future, she will become an incredible girl who will take everything from Bella. But now she is a lonely girl who needs someone's support. She fearfully asks to accept the gift and says that she would be very happy if the first princess liked it. Arabella thinks she is stupid because you can't be so defenseless when you don't really understand what a person wants from you and whether they are honest with you. The girl accepts the handkerchief and the fourth princess shouts with joy that she will definitely win and falls to her knees. The strange feeling that Bella experiences every time she sees the kindness in her children's eyes is probably called superiority. Marina runs into the tent and nervously informs the surprised princess that the first empress and the third prince have arrived. All three come out of the tent. They greet each other while Judith stands aside. Milliam, jumping out of his nurse's arms, says that he has brought a small golden jewelry piece with a red stone to give to her. He made it especially for her. Bella sees the video stones and realizes that they have come to capture this moment. The prince complains that now she has short hair, but it was more beautiful with long hair. The princess is glad in her heart that she cut her hair because she won't have to show off for anyone else. Milliam sees the handkerchief in the girl's hands and shouts with displeasure that he wants to be the first to give her a gift. The boy hits the princess on the arm, causing the handkerchief to fall to the ground. Judith is as shocked as the first princess. The empress starts running over her son and asking if he was hurt, but Bella thinks that it was actually her who was hit. The girl realizes that he is just a five-year-old boy, but his mistakes need to be corrected. This is not the moment her mother wanted to capture on stone. The heroine has always fulfilled her wishes and played the role she was assigned. But now she is fed up with it. The girl offers Milliam to put the jewelry on her because she hasn't tried any on yet, and his will fit her just fine. Arabella shows herself to be a good sister. At her request, the prince says that the princess now looks even more beautiful. If she wins, he asks her to give him her spoils. For example, he would like to get a rabbit. Marina realizes that the princess is already tired of everything and helps her fix the jewelry, while the third prince throws a tantrum because they don't catch rabbits on the hunt even if he likes them. The empress orders the girl to look after Milliam because she plans to be at the hunting festival only on the first and last day. The first princess realizes once again that she does not care about her mother, although the girl did not expect support, but she could have said less vulnerably. The empress notices Judith standing off to the side and asks Bella with a murderous look how much longer she plans to stay with this low-grade creature. Last time, she had clearly asked her to behave herself, to show some pride as a princess and not to disappoint her. Bella wonders how much longer she will have to listen to such words addressed to her because no matter what she does, she will never earn her mother's love. The girl apologizes for her words, but first she activates the Dome of Power and explains to her mother that she should take a better approach to raising Milliam. The boy should be taught the etiquette of the palace. He may be small, but at least some norms must be observed, because a state event is not a place for children shouting. As his sister, the girl is concerned that such behavior could bring shame on their family and mother. The Empress does not understand how she can teach her and tell her how to behave to which the heroine says that this is just advice because she is worried about her younger brother. She can't stay with them any longer because she has to get ready for the festival and wishing them a good trip, she leaves. The girl explains that no one will hear their conversation beyond the barrier so that her mother doesn't worry. She can consider it a favor because honor is so important to the Empress. The oppressed mother takes her son with her and leaves. Arabella has just said everything she thinks and it makes her feel much better. Judith apologizes to her mistress for always causing her trouble. The princess asks Marina to give her the shawl that the fourth princess made. She takes it and wraps it around her wrist to the brunette's astonished gaze. The girl says that she will not wear any other jewelry than the one given to her by her younger brother, so their agreement with the prince is in force. The tournament is about to start, so Bella has to get ready. Judith wishes her good luck. Sitting on their horses, the princess and the duke decide where they will go to the loud applause of the fans. On the first day of the festival, Arabella captures a strange, magical creature that is difficult to catch. Everyone admires her hunting skills, until the duke brings in the crocus, an animal that hasn't been seen in about a decade. 
Bella says that she did not expect Killian's skill, but he replies that it was all because she wished him luck. To which the girl says, not without sincerity, that the Duke's luck accompanied him until the last day of the tournament. Bearheart is sure that if Arabella says it, it will be so. The girl can see in his eyes that he has no doubt. What makes the princess most angry is that she can feel it. On the second day, the Duke catches better fish than the princess again, which worries her greatly. On the third day, the situation repeats itself, and no one pays attention to Bella's catch. Killian notices her disappointment and comes over to say that it is difficult to catch such a beast alone. The princess does not share his optimism, but the Duke repeats that it is all thanks to her and asks her to accept his biggest catch as a gift. Offering a catch is a privilege that is only available to the winner of the tournament. In other words, Killian probably thinks that he has won this year as well. But the princess will not allow this. She puts her hand on her face and thanks him. The girl says that she will gladly accept the gift if there is such an opportunity. She would like to reciprocate, but it has already been decided who will get her booty. In fact, after she wins, Bela plans to give all the loot to herself, because she shouldn't give it to anyone else. Killian happily says that he can be happy until the end of the tournament because the princess has accepted his offer. Arabella discusses the Duke's behavior with Marina. She does not understand why he gives her gifts, but does not accept them. In the maid's opinion, everything looks good between them. People around them think they are a good couple. The girl orders Marina to stop. She doesn't even want to hear about it, because Killian will end up with Judith anyway. No matter how much Bella thinks, she finds it strange that she hasn't gotten any good booty since the festival began. It could be because of the shawl, because she hasn't worn it for the past three days. The princess tells Marina to bring it tomorrow before she leaves. Judith is a heroine of this world, and a favorite of the gods, so her gift can be considered a talisman from the goddess of victory. On the first day, the prey was good. I don't want to rely on superstition, but the girl is already starting to worry. Another option is to hunt elsewhere. Marina suggests that her lady visit the Hall of Eternal Night, and the heroine, enthusiastic about the idea, quickly gets ready. In the hall, the red-haired guy is being actively chased by the wizards because they are still at work because of his slowness. But the boy knows that they are lying, because the time for correctional labor has long since ended. One warden asks the other to go easy on the heretic, but the latter does not listen to him, because he is still angry because of the problems the fugitive has caused. Remembering this, the sorcerer hits the guy in the leg with a stick, and he drops the boxes of stones. The red-haired man is used to the cruelty that has been heaped upon him, as it is much better than an empty life. But there is something he cannot bear. The sorcerers curse at the heretic and call him worthless. The Count's son's mother left this world when he was very young. His father, as far as he could remember, always sat in his chambers and paid no attention to him. Over time, his father became more and more eccentric. Servants quit one by one because of his cruelty, and eventually, the nanny who took care of the boy left. Before leaving, the nanny left him one last gift. It was a video stone. The red-haired boy started stealing bread from the store, and the merchants had to ask the Count to keep a better eye on his son, but he simply replied that he would pay for everything. The father simply ordered Gerald to be obedient while he took care of business, calling him a useless puppy. Every evening, the boy held his breath and watched the girl with shining eyes search for Clover. It was the only thing that kept him alive. Even now, when his mind is in a fog, he is immersed in memories of the girl who wore a crown of Clover and smiled happily, about a girl who did not turn away from him. The Herald would like to see her now. At that moment, there is a shock of power, and the boy hears a voice telling him about the truth of the gossip that says that heretics are taught through cruelty in the castle of eternal night. The first princess appears before the astonished wardens. The men try to justify themselves by saying that they were only pointing a stick at the fallen stones. The hall of eternal night has always been cautious about teaching heretics. My lady says that the boy is not obliged to pick them up, and one of the wardens confirms her words by quickly flying over to the boy to pick him up off his knees. The first princess orders the guard to leave. She can see in his eyes that it is Geralt, Judith's knight, and her future victim. My lady is informed that Levanteon orders the boy to be taken to the laboratory. 
Bella is interested in how his research is going, and confidently thinks that in a little while she will make the boys her own. But first, she needs to make preparations. On the fourth day of the hunt, the second and third princesses are walking along discussing the men. They notice that Judith is following them. Chloe angrily thinks she can't get the girl to follow because of Arabella and her affection. Lloyd is still worried about Bella's cut hair, wondering why she did it. The women in their family have a different length. Chloe says that this made her look no less beautiful in the video with the birds circling around her. Liana notices that Chloe's ring, which she had worn in the morning, is missing. The second princess breaks down in tears because of the loss, and begins to chaotically recall where she might have lost the ring. Chloe comes up with a plan and turns to Judith, and asks if she knows what her ring looked like. The latter is silent, but the princess menacingly orders her to go look for it. Ramiel is watching all this through his spirit. His shadow has been following Judith for a long time, but hasn't seen anything special yet. He was waiting for some kind of spectacle. He doesn't understand why people like the hunting festival, because there is nothing better than a cool and fragrant house. Suddenly, the girl notices Milliam chasing a rabbit, but suddenly a huge animal appears behind him. Judith rushes to defend herself, and at that moment Ramiel realizes that something interesting is going to happen. At the same time, Bella is hunting in the forest. The change of location was for the better, she was finally able to catch a good prey. But the princess has a bad feeling that something is about to happen. By the way, if you recall, in the book The World of the Unrivaled Princess Judith, an accident happened during the hunting festival. Suddenly, a magical creature appeared and attacked the young prince. Judith tried to save him and put herself in a dangerous position, but Killian Bearheart saved her. This moment became a fateful meeting between the two main characters. The book did not specify the exact time of the incident, but it could have happened today. The first princess quickly rushes to the camp. She is informed that a magical creature has broken through the barrier, but fortunately no one was hurt. Only the young master was in danger. Milliam falls into his sister's arms. The first princess asks where Killian is, because she needs to thank him for saving a member of the imperial family. The guards are surprised to hear that the duke has not yet returned from the hunt, and they have managed to tame the monster. Bella is shocked that events have changed. She asks if anyone was with the young prince when the attack happened. He answers that the fourth princess was with him, but she immediately left. The older sister has to punish her because the girl pushed him. The Empress arrives at the camp, furious that the boy's nanny, Countess Magnoa, did not watch him. The Empress angrily strikes the Countess while others watch. Bella thinks that she may be a nanny, but she is a Countess first and foremost. The woman is guilty, but this attitude is unacceptable. The Empress reproaches the First Princess for not protecting the Prince, which is her only duty as a sister. She replies that Milliam is in shock, but he is fine. The Empress reaches out to strike Arabella for ignoring her question, but Marina stands in for her. The maid humbly says that she will gladly accept the punishment for her actions as soon as she arrives at the palace. Bella realizes that her mother wanted to hit her in front of everyone and doesn't care about her daughter's position and feelings. The Empress shouts that she is saved by Milliam's integrity, otherwise she would not have forgiven the princess. Bella orders Marina to be taken to a doctor, but the Empress objects and insists that the maid be taken to her palace for punishment. Arabella confidently says that Marina will not go anywhere. She is her maid, and she should be rewarded, not punished, for protecting the princess. The first princess forbids her people to lead her, after the way her mother treated her in public. Marina is the only person who cares about Bella, unlike her mother. Arabella says that the mother should first reward the person who saved her son. Before blaming others, the Empress should look at her own behavior. The Empress begins to humiliate her daughter again when Milliam intervenes. He asks her not to curse her sister, and the mother turns her attention to her son. Arabella is about to leave, but is called back by her mother. Killian is silently watching the scene from the side. The girl feels as if thousands of bugs have crawled under her skin and are slowly eating her from the inside. She tries to run away from everyone and from this disgusting feeling. Bella accidentally meets a badly injured Judith. On the other side of the world, the princess has seen different events. Since she changed her hunting location, so did the Duke. That's why he was too late and couldn't save the fourth princess. In the future, 
Judith will shine the brightest of all. Looking at her, Arabella sees a confused herself. Bella asks why Judith hasn't gone to the doctor, but the girl replies that no one cares about her now. The princess is nervous about Ramiel's shadow peeping at them, so she destroys it under her younger sister's incomprehensible gaze. The first princess puts her hands in Judith's hair and, ignoring the warning that the girl is a prodigal, begins to treat the brunette. Bursting into tears, Judith thanks her and says that my lady is very kind to her. The heroine thinks that she is worthless if she is touched by the fact that she was treated differently. They are similar in some ways, even though it is wrong. On the other hand, who knows what will happen in the future? The first princess, born to an empress, and the fourth princess, the child of a maid, have different backgrounds. The princess asks if Judith likes her, and she sincerely answers that yes, she is the only one who is so kind to the girl. For a moment, a feeling of superiority and control arose in Belia's heart. Her younger sister, filled with hatred, could take everything away from the heroine, but she will prevent it. Arabella will become such an important person in Judith's life that she will not be able to drive her away. The princess asks if the younger girl wants to become her real sister and hopes to beat fate in this way. A few days later, Marina takes a walk with Bella in the garden. She regrets that the hunting festival has been suspended as she had hoped for the princess to win. Most of all, this happened because of the Empress's scandal. The heroine asks how the maid's face is, but she happily says that thanks to her mistress's magic, there is not even a scar. Marina says that Bella has changed. They head straight for Judith's palace. The fourth princess is surprised to see her sister and invites her to her room, because the living room is not cleaned. Bella did not expect to see such a neglected palace with no servants. Even in the bedroom, there is only one chair. Judith serves terrible tea, while Arabella thinks that a maid should do it, especially since she didn't pour herself a drink. It is clear how she is treated here. The fourth princess says that she didn't have time to thank her properly last time and asks how the third prince is feeling. Bella thinks that there is no one else to worry about. If the role of the main character requires being stupid and kind, then she will not be able to do it until her death. Judith is glad that her sister's younger brother was not hurt. Arabella argues that the brunette was hurt instead. They agree that Judith is now officially her younger sister. Bella says that she is not throwing words to the wind and orders to bring another chair, because the next time she visits, it will be awkward if they have to sit like this again. The heroine makes a plan to slowly destroy Judith's life until she is completely hers, before others want her too. At breakfast, Bella suggests to the emperor that Judith's palace be restored, as it is in a state of disrepair. Everyone is shocked to hear this. Chloe interjects that the fourth princess's palace should be completely redone because no one cares about her. As the first princess, Arabella wanted to set an example for the others so that they would start caring for each other. The emperor says that she can solve such trifles herself, and his daughter should deal with the empress because she is no longer a child. Bella is sure that her father, even knowing her character, is confident that the princess will make concessions to her mother. Chloe runs after the first princess and asks why she is so worried about Judith, but Bella excuses herself by saying that she cares about her younger sister. The second princess is shocked by her sister's words, and Ramiel complains that he was hurt when the blonde stepped on his shadow. He asks her not to do it again. 